The Friends of Farm Foundation program can help you further expand your network with a diverse group of food and agriculture leaders. Entry-level benefits include virtual networking sessions, while contributions at the upper levels unlock additional benefits, such as a personalized tour of our new innovation and education campus. Help us celebrate 90 years of making a positive impact on the future of agriculture. Visit farmfoundation.org to explore the benefits of becoming a friend and supporter of Farm Foundation today. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for our Farm Foundation Forum, Greening the Fertilizer Industry. We are glad to have the opportunity to engage with you today and are thankful to Farm Credit for their support of this forum. My name is Martha King and I am the Vice President of Programs and Projects at Farm Foundation, located just outside of Chicago, Illinois. I'm looking forward to today's discussion on where we stand with fertilizer production and usage and where we might go to create more sustainable and environmentally friendly fertilizer products in the future. Before we get into today's program, I'm going to take just a few moments to share a bit more about Farm Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit working at the intersection of agriculture and society to address challenges that affect the entire food and ag value chain. Specifically, we are an accelerator of practical solutions for agriculture, accelerating people and ideas into action. This year, we are celebrating 90 years of doing this work. The three levers we use to accomplish this are policy, innovation, and education. Forums such as today's are just one part of our extensive program of work, which is guided by our mission to build trust and understanding at the intersection of agriculture and society, and our vision to build a future for farmers, our communities, and our world. We rely on partnerships to fund our work and increase our impact. So if you're interested in learning more about funding or partnering with us, I invite you to reach out to explore collaboration. Now I'd like to take a minute to highlight our Friends of Farm Foundation program. With your enrollment as a friend, you will not only be helping to support the mission and vision of Farm Foundation, but you will also gain exclusive benefits such as first reads of our issue reports, networking opportunities, and much more. Being a friend is an investment in building a future for farmers, our communities, and our world. To learn more about being a friend of Farm Foundation, go to farmfoundation.org friends. The link is also being posted in the chat. In addition to learning more about Farm Foundation and our work by visiting our website, I encourage you to connect with us on our social media platforms. If you are posting on social media about this morning's session, we ask that you please use hashtag Farm Foundation Forum. And now I'd like to go over a few uh, final housekeeping notes. There will be an audience question and answer session at the end of today's forum. We'll be using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, not the chat, to queue questions. So please uh, look for that and enter your questions at any time throughout the forum. This forum is being recorded and will be posted on our website at farmfoundation.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. We'll send out the link uh, for the video following today's program. When the forum concludes, you will receive a link to a brief survey. We appreciate your feedback and time in completing the survey. Now let's turn to today's forum topic, greening the fertilizer industry. We have a truly outstanding panel of industry leaders joining us today, and we look forward to them sharing their insights. It's my pleasure to introduce as our moderator and discussion leader, Farm Foundation Roundtable Fellow, Jay Vroom. Over his 45-year career, Jay has focused on the agricultural inputs and grain merchandising sectors. His professional expertise focuses on food and ag public policy and communications outreach. After working for four distinct U.S. ag trade associations, the last 30 years of which he served as CEO of CropLife America, Jay is now a senior advisor at the firm's DCLRS Inc. and OFW Law in Washington, D.C., and he and his wife, Jamie, operate the consultancy Vroom Lee Agriculture, LLC. Jay, thank you for moderating our forum today. Thank you, Martha, and good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me uh, and you don't need to see me, but uh, it's a delight to welcome everybody to participate in this uh, Farm Foundation Forum. I would have to say that uh, being on the inside of the content uh, here just a little bit. I am completely amazed by the professional expertise of Martha, you and the team and Sherry and everyone else at uh, Farm Foundation for putting together such a sophisticated and professional organized uh, webinar format. And uh, we're delighted to have five fantastic speakers to provide the real content for today's webinar topic, which is, of course, about greening the fertilizer industry. Um, we all know that climate and climate smart agriculture now roll off of all of our tongues. And one of the most important uh, components of keeping agriculture profitable, 
and growing and helping to feed a troubled and hungry world is the delivery of essential nutrients for the crops that we grow that feed our livestock and directly feed all of us as consumers. Uh, as Martha indicated, uh, I've worked for four different industry segments in my trade association career. Two of those were in relationship to the fertilizer industry itself. Uh, I worked uh, first at the Fertilizer industry Institute uh, as my first job out of college. I also worked for what is now the Agricultural Retailers Association later in my career. And throughout my life, uh, being a farmer from Illinois, uh, I've had the pleasure of buying fertilizer and using animal waste as fertilizers. So I'm really excited to hear from our experts today. And without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce uh, the first one of our expert uh, content providers. And uh, to start off our conversation, we'll hear from Farm Foundation board member Sherry DeYoung. Sherry serves as co-owner and financial chief financial officer for AgriVision Farm Management, a company that oversees management for 27 family-owned and operated agricultural businesses. Sherry is also the chief financial officer and co-owner for Natural Prairie Dairy, one of the largest family-operated organic dairy farms in the United States, based in Hartley, Texas. Sherry and her husband, Donald, who is a fraternity brother, have to give him a shout out. Also oversee the DeYoung Foundation, an organization whose mission is to empower people in agriculture worldwide. It's nice to see you again, Sherry, and uh, over to you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, shout out. Thank you, Jay, for the shout out for the uh, fraternity Alf Gamma So anyway, um, good morning, everyone. And a special thank you to the Farm Foundation. Uh, for putting on this webinar on a very important topic and to you, Jay, as well uh, as our moderator. So I'm here today to talk to you about our farming operation and our partnership with Cedron Technologies in a new technology called the Barcore that we believe will be a game changer in the world of animal agriculture. Next slide, please. Very quickly, just a little bit about our farm operation. Our farm has multiple farm uh, operations, both conventional and organic in Texas, Indiana, and Colorado. Uh, the organic farm, Natural Prairie Dairy that Jay mentioned earlier, is the one that I'm specifically talking about today where we are testing and utilizing this new technology. We're a family farm operation. Donald and I currently have four nephews and a daughter participating in management uh, within our farm and dairy operation. So if you ever want to discuss family, business, and succession planning, I am your person. Next slide, please. What do we do? So Natural Prairie Dairy produces organic milk from our environmentally sustainable farms in Texas and Indiana. Next, please. As part of our operations, you can see that we have organic pastures and we graze our cows on the land. And this is part of the organic rules that we follow. So utilizing the best fertilizer on our land is essential to our business and in maximizing the value of our pastures and our crop lands that help feed our cows for the entire year. Next, please. As part of our sustainability and environmental soundness, we maximize our resources like water, and the new VARCOR waste management system is the new technology that we're using on the farm. This new system takes manure from the cows and puts it through a system. And then we end up with useful materials and products such as NPK fertilizer, aqueous ammonia that's rich in nitrogen and water. Next slide. So those of you in animal agriculture, uh, what would I say if we could eliminate manure ponds? And I bet you would say, show me. Next. The VARCOR system is just that, a system that can take cow manure and distill it efficiently into clean water, a portable dry odorless NPK fertilizer and aqueous ammonia that serves as a great source of nitrogen uh, for our crops. Next slide, please. So a brief history of how we got here. Next. Uh, back in 2015, Bill Gates engaged an engineer by the name of Peter Janicki 
with Janicki Industries to build what they called at that time an omniprocessor that turns human sewer sludge into clean water, electricity, and ash. So Gates's motivation at the time was to help provide clean drinking water for developing countries. Um, I, I have just a real short snippet video um, that really reviews the basic process and kind of introduces Peter Janicki and, and how we got here, kind of building up to how we got here. So next, and I believe you, you can play the video right here. Over two and a half billion people have no access to safe sanitation. We asked brilliant engineers to help us solve this problem. And one of those engineers actually has proposed a solution where the waste is valuable. The Omni processor turns sewer sludge, which is kind of nasty, into clean drinking water, electricity, and ash that is pathogen free. This is where the sludge enters the machine. It goes up this conveyor belt, is fed into these large tubes we call the dryer. That's where we boil the sludge. And in the boiling process, we separate the water vapor from the solids. The solids are now dry and we can feed them into the fire. Once we have this very hot fire, we can make high pressure, high temperature steam. And we take that steam and we send it to a steam engine. And the steam engine drives a generator that makes electricity that we use for the processor and also excess electricity that can be delivered back to the community. The water vapor that's created in the boiling process is run through a cleaning system until we have the cleanest, purest water you can possibly imagine. The sanitation system as we know it in the developed world cannot work in developing countries. So what we need in developing countries is a very simple system. The entrepreneur that owns this processor will get paid for the input, the sludge. And that same entrepreneur will get paid for the outputs, the electricity, the water, and the ash. I am very impressed with this solution we're seeing here. It generates electricity, it generates clean water. It will grow to every corner of the earth that needs it because it makes money every day. It's water. So that was how it all started. That was back in 2015. And what kind of started as um, the uh, a reason to have uh, clean drinking water, um, Peter's wife, it just so happened, was from a dairy farm. So he's like, what if we kind of change and do this on a dairy farm? So that was how it was started. And that was how our partnership with Peter Janicki and the Cedron Technology Company. So this is a schematic of what the bar core system does. So we begin with a liquid manure waste that is sand free. So we currently have McClanahan sand separators that separate out the sand from the liquid waste. This waste goes through the dryer where heat is engaged and then a thermal evaporation results and solid and liquid fractions are separated. So the resulting vapor is sent to the compressor where it undergoes a mechanical recompression. In transferring its heat, most of the vapor condenses and forms a water output. I know it can get very complicated, but, but basically it's similar to the process to making condensed milk. So the remaining vapor is concentrated and condensed into the ammonia solution. Simply put, dry solids fall while water exit and the ammonia rises and is captured. So through this process, um, all of these products are the are on the uh, the outputs. Next slide, please. On our farm social media accounts, our dairy team has shared our excitement as the benefits that we see in this new technology. So I'd like to share this very short video as well from our team, and this just happens to be on our farm there in Indiana. Why Natural Prairie is adopting VARCOR and, and this technology is, is really it goes back to our core values. It's always been an uncomfortable situation on how to properly handle our manure. Doing our best sometimes wasn't good enough. And saying how do we have a robust enough system that, that has no chance of hurting our neighbors or environment 
and saying, how do we get there? We know that we have to take care of the land. We know we have to take care of the cows. And having a system like the VAR Corps enables us to plan for the future. So Cedron has partnered with Natural Prairie Dairy to really revolutionize this agricultural waste streams. The VARCOR is a revolutionary and amazing system that takes a manure stream in and produces three products. One, concentrated aqueous ammonia. Two, a dry, pathogen-free, weed-free fertilizer. And three, a gorgeous, crystal clear water suitable for drinking for the cows. So the VARCOR takes the nutrients, the poop, and turns it into stuff that we can use very safely so we can keep growing more food and make more milk. It is really neat to think that you can take cow manure and put it into this system and that it's a whole natural process. This can really contribute to helping a dairy farm be a closed loop system. The Varcor is absolutely unique. There is nothing like it. I have never seen anything like it and I don't see anything in 10 years anything like it. So it, it solved problems in a way that nothing else has ever solved. Would I drink the water coming off the Varcor? 100% yes. I am unbelievably optimistic about our future. We will take care of these cows right. We are gonna advance in knowledge and technology. It's just really exciting. I know that if I could look down in 100 years from now, and I'm gonna go, holy moly, wow. Look what they've done. So you might be asking about the energy cost, but the VARCOR is actually very efficient with its energy. The heat builds and can maintain through the actual process. Next slide, please. The heat application promotes evaporation that separates the solids from the other components. So we basically boil the manure, which starts the process, and it's part of the chemical engineering process that the natural processes occur as a result of that heat. Um, we do not, there's no additives or anything. So the fact that we have a certified organic farm um, for us to be utilizing the outputs um, is uh, very important to our process. Next slide, please. And then as you see, as the vapor cools and condenses, the ammonia and the water components are released. Next, please. So perhaps one of the most valuable products of the Barker for us is the weed-free fertilizer. So it's it's boiled, it's heated, so all the weeds are dead. Uh, raw manure can have weed seeds in it, and we end up just putting it back on the uh, land for, of course, the weeds to grow. As an organic farm, manure and compost are really about the only uh, things that we can utilize for fertilizer. So through this process, this manure becomes much more valuable um, to us. And then also the fact that the aqueous ammonia is captured and then we can apply it to crops as they need it. And the dry NPK fertilizer is pathogen free and can be transported obviously much easier than liquid manure. Um, there's also less odor and less risk of nutrient runoff. So that's certainly a benefit for farmers with neighbors. And then the cost and energy recovery makes uh, really the overall system very cost, uh, cost effective even for us dairy farmers. Next, please. Uh, as you are probably aware, more and more dairies are actually putting in digesters. So you might be asking, how would this work with a digester? Um, and we're, at, we're actually putting in a digester right now. And we believe that you know, through the digester process, so then we can have, you know, get our you know, the carbon credits and, and, and all the other things that are um, positives with the digester, but then utilizing the digestate, the, the final product from a digester, and then putting it within the bar core process, we end up getting the uh, uh, same types of product, uh, the, the same products that we would even if we did not have a digester. Uh, next, uh, the reduction in greenhouse gases and decreasing methane emissions are also part of our green agenda and our environmental sustainability that our farm takes very uh, seriously. So the VARCOR helps us by, you know, basically there's just less trucks and application equipment um, that we currently have or did have through the handling of liquid manure versus utilizing the dry and the concentrated fertilizers. Next. So in 2022 at our dairy in Indiana, we processed over uh, 15 and a half gallons of clean uh, uh, 
manure. And so with that, the outputs that we calculated through the uh, year was about 12 million gallons of clean water, about 450,000 pounds of dry NPK fertilizer, and about 70 8,000 of aqueous, uh, 78,000 of aqueous ammonia. So these fertilizer products are then applied to the farmland at the time when our crops need them. Um, plus we, and you know, we have the ability to store those products to be able to use for later use, handling liquid manure on a daily basis. You have to apply it every day, no matter what. Next slide, please. So ultimately, the DeYoung family is looking to be in the dairy business for the long term. And that means partnering and testing new technologies to help create a more sustainable closed loop system for our operations. The use of the VARPA is just one, uh, one more way to create those efficiencies and utilize the products from our cows, meaning the manure, and creating useful, uh, valuable products for our land that grows the crops to feed our cows. So the, the future holds many promising technologies and this is just really one of them. Next. So thank you for the opportunity to share this very exciting um, technology that, that we're currently using. And um, I believe we'll have time for questions later. Thank you, Jay. Perfect, Sherry. Thank you so much for sharing that incredible story for any of us who have worked in animal agriculture historically, we know that uh, what you're doing here is really revolutionizing part of agriculture that uh, wasn't always so easy to cope with and you're turning it into something so positive. So really amazing. I look forward to uh, the Q&A that uh, will flow from that presentation. Uh, and thanks also for your leadership and support of Farm Foundation as well. Um, Next, we're going to hear from Alzbeta Klein. Alzbeta is the CEO and Director General of the International Fertilizer Association. In her role, she is the leading global fertilizer industry spokesperson, uh, helping create and support productive and sustainable agriculture systems that contribute to a world free of hunger and malnutrition. Previously uh, in her career, Alzbeta held uh, leadership roles for IFC World Bank Group's climate business, positioning IFC as a lead investor in green ESG investments, particularly in the emerging markets. Alzbeta is headquartered along with the rest of the IFA team in Paris, France, and we are excited to hear from you this morning. Thank you very much, Jay, and thanks to the foundation for this very kind invite. Um, Sherry, you have described uh, really well the new technology and you really highlighted what sustainability could look like on a farm. What I'd like to bring in is two other topics um, that we had looked at very closely over the past year, and that is availability and affordability together with sustainability of plant nutrients. And what I'd like to do in this presentation is to highlight all three. Um, and highlight what the world has gone through over the past year uh, or 18 months, why you have seen what you have seen when it came to mineral fertilizers, and what are the next steps in terms of av availability, affordability, and sustainability of mineral fertilizers. Next slide, please. So what we have seen um, over the past uh, 18 months or so is that what we have taken for granted, which is availability of fertilizers, is not that simple. And we also realize that if we don't have fertilizers, uh, it is going to have a huge impact on what's happening in farm. And it's not just about mineral fertilizers, it is about organic, it is about any kind of plant nutrients um, that are useful to agriculture. So let me briefly talk about the market structure um, of the three key macronutrients and um, on their price elasticity and why they matter. Um, as you know, nitrogen is pretty widely distributed in terms of production, but it is produced mainly where there is source of energy. And this became very, very clear um, during, the, um, during the last year, during the war in Ukraine, because the price of gas in Europe suddenly increased to such levels that Europe at some point had shut down about 70% of its nitrogen capacity. This has not been the case in the United States. This has not been the case in the Middle East with ample supplies of, uh, of gas. 
But still, we have seen a run up of prices of nitrogen fertilizers because we were missing a substantial part of the capacity. We we're missing the Western European capacity in the market. And we have also seen uh, the missing, partly missing supplies from Russia. Now, when it comes to crops, those of you who are farmers in the audience, you know that um, you need to apply nitrogen every year. So it is rather inelastic in its, um, in its uh, possibilities of application. Now, when it comes to phosphates, as you can see here, um, the largest uh, producers are China and Morocco and the United States. But what we have seen over the past couple of uh, couple of years is arbitrary conditions that uh, stopped exports. So, for example, in China, we have not seen exports coming out for a substantial part of last year because of the domestic policy to keep the fertilizer for themselves. Um, use of uh, phosphates is highly correlated with affordability. And we have seen that there was quite a bit of demand destruction last year because of lack of availability. The trickiest macronutrient uh, for all of us is potash. Uh, why is that the case? It's the case because um, the three largest countries that supply potash globally are Canada, Russia, and Belarus. And about 40% of global trade were in sanctioned countries, meaning in Belarus and in Russia. And um, most of you, I, I believe, are based in the United States. So you know that it is OK to bring Russian fertilizer to the United States. That's not the case with Belarus. And Belarus accounts for about 20% of global market. So what you have seen is a run up in prices and um, lack of availability, plain lack of availability. Things that we never thought was possible, we will not have enough fertilizer. Well, that actually materialized in, um, in 2022. Next slide, please. Now, when we started the year uh, and when the war broke out in Ukraine, we um, didn't know what's going to happen in the market and how much product will actually get out of Russia. Um, fortunately, quite a bit of product did get out of Russia. And as you can see here, um, global urea production continued um, quite, at a quite a good pace. Um, global potash, unfortunately, uh, took a deep dive because of the inability to, um, to export and uh, phosphates were obviously doing well. So even though we were quite worried about what's going to happen, uh, fortunately, we got pretty good supply out uh, last year. However, this has not been the case in um, every market. Why? Because unlike the farmers in the United States, most of you who are in the audience are pretty large farmers, Farmers in Western Europe, likewise, very large farmers. Um, South America, Brazil, Argentina, same thing. That is not the case in Africa. That is not a case in East Asia. And for a lot of farmers, the issue last year became both availability, just a plain question, how am I going to get my fertilizer, but also affordability because the product um, has gotten quite, a, quite, quite, uh, quite expensive because of the reasons that I just mentioned. Next slide, please. There are many factors, and one more click, please, on a slide. There are many factors that have an impact on um, affordability of fertilizer. And some of the things that I like to highlight here um, is um, ability to hedge against the crop. Um, as we know, in parts of South America, farmers hedge quite quickly um, uh, against the final crop. Um, it is about the scale um, of the farm. It is about a location and distance from the port. What we have seen on this particular topic over the past year, and you on a farm may not see the whole supply chain, but we've seen quite a bit of a buildup um, of the supply chain inefficiencies related to COVID. Uh, we have seen delays in a number of ports, and those are not just ports in Africa. There were ports in the United States that were backed up for uh, weeks on end. Um, and this definitely slowed down the, uh, the ability to get the fertilizer on a farm um, uh, on time and at the time when you actually need it. Um, access to credit, this has been a huge issue, not in the United States, but in many other parts of the world. Because when you have a company that is geared at, uh, to a price of fertilizer at, say, about three or $400 a ton, and suddenly that price um, goes, uh, goes to... Uh, uh, you know, double that, 
you suddenly need credit lines that are double the size of your previous credit lines. So access to credit has definitely been an issue. And last but not least is the local currency. Again, United States being a reserve currency, that has not been an issue, but US dollar has been the highest that we've seen it in, uh, in many, many years and perhaps even decades. And that had a huge impact on the affordability of fertilizer, especially in developing countries. So let's go to the next slide. And one more click, please. Um, what was the global response uh, in, in the marketplace? And what we have seen here is that we have countries that have uh, explicitly uh, supported Ukraine and countries that have not explicitly supported Ukraine and countries that have condemned the attack and countries that have not. And so uh, access to fertilizer, unfortunately, depended very much on which side of that equation you were standing, right? So countries that were reasonably friendly or are reasonably friendly to Russia still got quite a bit of fertilizer. Um, countries that um, decided to condemn the attack um, didn't get a whole lot of fertilizer from, uh, from those regions. We have also seen um, uneven impact of sanctions Again, in the United States, um, the government was very explicit about uh, the ability to bring in Russian material, which has not been sanctioned. The owners have been sanctioned. That has not been the case in Western Europe, and that has not been the case in the rest of the world. So sanctions have been biting into the supply, um, into the supply of fertilizer. Next slide, please. So what does that mean for farms? What does it mean for the farmers? It means that reduced fertilizer applications have huge implications on global food production. I'd like to highlight here that this year is the fourth year in a row where in the United States, we actually consume more than we produce. Um, stock to use ratios are coming in the wrong direction. Um, here we try to uh, present what it means uh, to apply less fertilizer and how it translates into calories. And so if you look at the world as, as a total under perfect trading conditions, you'd say, okay, not a big deal. Maybe we lost two and a half percent of calories uh, overall because of under fertilization. But if you look at where that happened, you look at the darker uh, parts um, of this map and you see that it's happening mainly in Africa. So it's happening in a poorer parts of the world where we are going to have lack of uh, calories going forward. So to sum up this part about the availability and affordability of mineral fertilizers, I'd like to highlight that th the impact is yet to be seen because we have seen last year um, a substantial demand destruction. We have seen that farmers under fertilized, perhaps they use nitrogen, but they definitely haven't used as much potash and phosphates as they used in the past, and that's global. Um, and we're going to see what that means in terms of yields. And we also have a live example of what happens when you do not use fertilizer at all. Unfortunately, uh, in the country of Sri Lanka, they decided not to apply any fertilizer, mainly because they didn't have resources to buy it. We have seen the yields um, in six months of non-application going down between 20 and 40%. So the real impact in terms of availability of food is yet to be seen um, this year, and, and we'll have to be very vigilant so we don't actually walk into another global food crisis like we've seen in 2008. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we do not have a luxury to deal with availability, affordability, and sustainability sequentially. We have to actually take care of it all at the same time. And so we at EFA, at the International Fertilizer Association, we have worked on a few things at the same time. First and foremost, we are looking at the emissions, which is a scope to emissions, and those are emissions from the factory. When it comes to potash and phosphate, those are mined commodities, so the profile of emissions is very different from nitrogen, which has very heavy uh, profile when it comes to emissions. So in 2022, we teamed up with the International Energy Agency and we produced a scope to emission study on how to reduce emissions from nitrogen. In uh, 2022, uh, this is 2021, in 2022, we teamed up with a company called Systemic, and we looked at how we can reduce emissions on the farm, um, emissions from fertilizer use. And I just put a little um, excerpt from the report um, on this slide. Um, 
we cannot decarbonize nitrogen to net zero, but we can compensate with what we can do on a farm. And as we have seen in a previous presentation, there's quite a lot we can do on a farm to curtail the emissions. The topic that is coming up and it's coming up quite actively is biodiversity. Uh, you may have seen that United Nations organized biodiversity COP in Montreal in um, December of last year. And we have to really start getting our arms around what our industry, what plant nutrient industry means for the biodiversity, how we can safeguard biodiversity on a farm, what are the things we need to do better, how do we prevent runoffs, how do we prevent um, uh, application of fertilizers that could harm biodiversity, but at the same time, fertilizers actually improve biodiversity and improve soil organic matter. So we have to look at both of these and we have to you know, get our arms as an industry around it and create a very clear path to safeguarding uh, biodiversity. Now, how do we go about it? Next slide, please. It's going to happen through innovation. And uh, at IFA, we created a platform called Smart and Green, where tech meets plant nutrition. What we find is that we have a number of startups, including one that Cherry was talking about just, uh, just a moment ago, um, there is a number of companies who are looking both at how to decarbonize nitrogen value chain, how to produce nitrogen closer to the farm so that it doesn't have to be transported, what to do about green hydrogen, green ammonia, and how to transport it and how to actually help decarbonize that value chain. And what do we need to do on the farm to fertilize better and to feed our plants better, whether it's a combination of biologicals, microbials, organic and inorganic fertilizers, basically all of the ways that we can get plant nutrients to soil. We strongly believe that innovation is the way to go and it will drive growth of agriculture and it will drive it sustainably. So to sum it up, um, we have a triple challenge ahead of us and that is how do we make sure that fertilizers are available, plant nutrients are available? How do we make sure that they are affordable in all parts of the world? And how do we do that sustainably? And I look forward to your questions and comments and to a good discussion afterwards. Over to you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Alzbeta. Uh, what a great uh, overview you provided for the commercial fertilizer industry uh, internationally. Uh, so thank you for uh, capturing that in a very succinct presentation overview. Uh, next, we're going to turn to the United States and our friend Corey Rosenbush. Corey is uh, president and CEO of the Fertilizer Institute, which is the organization that represents the United States commercial fertilizer industry. Prior to joining TFI in 2020, Corey served as president and CEO of the Global Cold Chain Alliance for 14 years. And before that, uh, he lived and worked in Indonesia, implementing a United States Department of Agriculture, Food and agriculture development program uh, for the Borlaug Institute. And early in his career, Corey served as president of the National FFA organization. Good morning, Corey. Good morning, Jay. Thanks uh, Thanks for having me. Really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to join you all today. Uh, and, and I love when our, our worlds intersect. Um, I uh, you know, grew up uh, in Texas uh, near Stephenville where Sherry uh, got her start and actually judged dairy cattle in the uh, uh, dairy capital of Texas. And uh, it's great to see that you know, the, those communities are making these kind of innovations. I uh, also wanna thank Alzbeta for her leadership. I'm just happy that, that someone else covered the fertilizer market story uh, and I didn't have to today. Uh, but IFA has really been uh, leading uh, in fertilizer sustainability topics, and uh, they've, I think, inspired all of us uh, around the globe to think about what sustainability means uh, for the fertilizer industry. So today, I'm going to highlight uh, really what is this unique opportunity we have to uh, make an impact on um, the changing climate, both from the manufacturing of fertilizer, but also from, from fertilizer use. So this past month, we released uh, the industry sustainability report, and the report really highlighted uh, the impact that uh, the industry has been making on sustainability efforts. We had 16 different manufacturing companies, which make up about 92 percent 
of the total uh, production in the United States that participated. So think about this as the industry's collective ESNG uh, report. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't start though with safety because that is uh, the number one priority of many of our member companies. And as you think about the safety metrics in the industry, uh, we have continued to perform more than two times uh, better than a lot of our uh, peers in other manufacturing and mining sectors. Uh, as you look specifically at some of the sustainability efforts uh, around manufacturing, uh, we've been able to make tremendous improvements in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this last report, 31% of greenhouse gases were captured and not emitted, and that's a 368% increase from when we first started this report more than a decade ago. When you think about the total investment that this industry has made in sustainability in the last two years, it tops over $1 billion in capital. Uh, that, that is going to increase significantly, I believe, uh, in the coming years because of this hot topic around what we call low carbon ammonia. So as a bit of a background, you have to think about uh, ammonia as being that building block for all nitrogen fertilizers. And ammonia is produced through the, through the Haber-Bosch process where natural gas is both the fuel uh, as well as the feedstock for natural uh, for ammonia production. As a matter of fact, it makes up anywhere from 80 to 90% of the total cost of producing ammonia. And so we've been very fortunate to have uh, an abundant and uh, supply uh, of natural gas in the United States. Uh, as Alzbeta mentioned, Europe did not quite have that same experience last year when natural gas topped over $100 per MMBTU and you saw nearly 70% of nitrogen uh, production that had to be curtailed, which of course had an impact on global fertilizer markets as well. So as we think about natural gas and its role in low carbon ammonia, it will continue to play an important role. And that's why we advocate for sound energy policy uh, with this administration in Congress. Uh, but we're also innovating. And so low carbon ammonia will often use green or blue to describe some of these processes. But essentially to boil it down, it's about being able to sequester the carbon that comes from that Haber-Bosch process or replace natural gas and to be able to use other um, uh, sources of green, um, green electricity, such as uh, electrolysis, in order to take the water and combine it with nitrogen to, to have that particular ammonia output. A lot of what's driving uh, this effort uh, is, of course, demand. And we will uh, see a time when a lot of the uh, energy source will use that hydrogen molecule as opposed to the nitrogen molecule that ag agriculture uh, currently needs. Uh, you know, you see it in the maritime shipping industry. Uh, a lot of countries in uh, Asia, uh, such as Japan, are using it as an electricity source. And as you think about a policy impact that uh, that sat on this low carbon ammonia production, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, was really center to that conversation. Uh, without getting technical, there was a 45Q tax credit that essentially incentivized carbon uh, capture and sequestration and helped facilitate a lot of the investment or, or really make a business case for a lot of these uh, investments. I was actually speaking with a, a European nitrogen producer shortly after the Inflation Reduction Act was passed. And uh, he was quite upset by it because he knew that it was going to really shift uh, the landscape for uh, you know, greening fertilizer production, to use the title of the webinar, uh, from Europe and the investments that are being made there to the United States and, and make US ammonia, low carbon ammonia production very, um, uh, very, very successful. Uh, we as an industry are also looking at how to define and certify low, low carbon ammonia production. So uh, TFI and some of the existing ammonia producers have developed a standard of how to measure uh, the carbon intensity of that ammonia production and then ultimately uh, offer a commercial vehicle for certification of it in sales. Now, the big question I always get, and I'm going to uh, step out on a limb here and offer a little a bit of a personal perspective, uh, how will this be used in fertilizer? We talked about this, the hydrogen source for energy, but what about for fertilizer use? I think we're probably still years away from low carbon ammonia uh, you know, being used uh, in the fertilizer market space. Uh, there's going to have to be some sort of a, a market-based incentive because it is going to be a higher production price or production cost and price. 
And so I'm not necessarily gonna, gonna see this low carbon ammonia flooding uh, farms uh, in the near future, but I do think years to come or years down the road, we might, we might see that impact. So if we, if we fast forward then to the second opportunity we have, which is really fertilizer on the farm, I think it's uh, it's appropriate to look at what's happened in the fertilizer market and what uh, Al's beta, uh highlighted uh, really has been an interesting conversation over the last uh, 18 months to two years, and that is uh, the significant increase in fertilizer prices. So every everything has a silver lining, and I think one of the things that we saw as a silver lining to the market conditions was uh, more than ever, farmers focused on 4R nutrient stewardship. So, you know, we want farmers to be efficient with their fertilizer use and using the four R's of applying fertilizer at the right source rate, time and place uh, is critical for not only achieving our environmental outcomes, but economic outcomes for farmers as well. But the other impact that we've seen, especially in the last year, is an explosion in innovation and technology. And I think as you look at um, you know, high commodity prices, strong net farm income, it's allowed the farmers to really start to think about uh, what are some other innovations or investments they can make in innovations that make their fertilizer uh, use more efficient. So whether that's biostimulants or enhanced efficiency fertilizers, such as coatings uh, to microbials, uh, all of those are really hot market items right now. I was uh, recently talking to an ag retailer who said that they daily get uh, you know, sales and marketing folks from some of these manufacturers wanting to have an appointment or come by and tell them about their new product. And just the pure volume of these innovations that are flowing through and uh, across the retailer's desks is a little bit overwhelming right now. Um, you probably have read a lot about how the government's even got involved in incentivizing some of these climate smart commodities, and that not only includes practices, but some of these technologies, innovations. And then last summer, uh, or fall rather, uh, President Biden uh, joined a farmer in Illinois where uh, he and uh, uh, Secretary of Ag Vilsack announced a $500 million commitment to investing in, in fertilizer supply or increasing fertilizer supply. Now, uh, for any of you that know what it takes to build an ammonia plant, we're talking one to four billion dollars. So uh, that impact may be minimal, but it did uh, allow a lot of uh, other companies to look at some of these innovations and how they can create, um, you know, tools and resources such as biostimulants or enhanced efficiency fertilizers. Those next generation of fertilizer technologies uh, uh, reach the market. Uh, while while that's appreciated, we also have been advocating really for a few policy solutions that uh, one provide path to market for some of these innovations. Uh, a lot of the conversation is how are they being regulated, and uh, they be regulated as a pesticide through FIFRA at EPA, or are they being regulated at the states uh, through the state fertilizer control officials as a plant nutrient product. Uh, the other big topic that really helps look at some of this efficiency is really permitting. Uh, whether that's manufacturing or mines, and ensuring that we have strong policy around uh, energy uh, relating back to, to natural gas, of course, and the key feedstock there for all ammonia uh, production and ultimately fertilizers. So if we think about the farm and the farmer and these tools that they have available, what is the impact that they can have from fertilizer use? So I want to show you a case study uh, or a couple of case studies that we've been focused on uh, with our for our with our for our farmer advocates. So last week at Commodity Classic, we were able to recognize three new for our farmers or farmers that have really uh, adopted some of the for our nutrient stewardship uh, practices. And much of our research and science strategy now is focused on how do we quantify the environmental and economic impact of those practices. So, for example, uh, one of the farmers right here in Virginia, where I live, uh, was able to use some of these practices and saw nutrient use efficiency, uh, or sorry, nitrogen use efficiency gone from 1.3 pounds of nitrogen per bushel uh, down to 0.9 pounds of use per bushel, uh, while at the same time uh, increasing yield uh, and also ultimately profitability. Uh, they had a variable rate application uh, practice that saw savings um, uh, near $10 uh, per acre when they adopted some of these practices. And these cases are numerous and it really highlights and shines the important role that, a fa that farmers are doing uh, in the field 
through for our nutrient stewardship, using some of these innovative technologies uh, to really make an impact, to make the ultimate impact that they can. Um, we see tremendous opportunities, just to go back to the beginning, both on the manufacturing side, but also on the farm and in the field side uh, to have an ultimate impact uh, on climate and on sustainability uh, in the United States, but also around the world. So thank you so much for allowing me an opportunity to highlight what the fertilizer industry is contributing to sustainability efforts. Thank you very much, Corey. Uh, great summary. And we look forward to uh, peppering you with some questions uh, as we move forward here. I'm going to turn to our last two presenters now uh, and pleased to welcome uh, a dynamic duo of Linda Thrasher and Carl Thies. Uh, both of them are co-founder, founder of Greenfield Nitrogen LLC, and uh, they are going to describe uh, some of this focus that we've already heard about uh, from earlier presentations on uh, the penultimate part of innovation, which is going forward, developing a standalone zero carbon green ammonia fertilizer manufacturing plant. Carl has over three decades of experience in agriculture and the fertilizer industries. He also operates a large farming agricultural production operation in Iowa. Linda is uh, co-founder of Greenfield Nitrogen and also serves as president of the organization. Uh, previously, uh, she served as a founding executive of the Mosaic Company and also worked for Cargill Incorporated. Linda began her career as a legislative staff member in the U.S. House of Representatives, focusing on agricultural, environmental, and trade policy. Thank you for joining us, Carl and Linda. Thank you, Jay. And I'll start first. And um, Corey and Elsbeth, it's great to follow both of you. You did a great job of painting the international and national landscape as it relates to the industry's carbon footprint and some of the challenges and opportunities. And Sherry, um, just like you did, you were a hard act to follow, but um, I want to talk about how we can take that global and national aspiration and really put it into local action, much like you did talking about your operation. We're going to talk about what we're doing in Northern Iowa. So Carl's story begins with, um, or the Greenfield story, right, that begins with Carl Tice, our founder. And Carl had the vision of really wanting to make sure that farmers had an ownership stake in their crop inputs. The problem is any of you who are farmers on this call and participating know that farmers are price takers. They're not price makers and they virtually have no control over their input costs. So Carl's desire when he started Greenfield was to model like the ethanol industry to give farmers an opportunity to receive a dividend, which in some respects is very much like a hedge on their ammonia prices, which they can't currently do. So we're off to the races and we are thrilled that we have so many farmer investors that are participating. So if you could now turn to the shovel ready site slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about who we are and where we're at. Um, several years ago, Greenfield secured a site in Northern Iowa. It is fully permitted and we're ready for construction. When we started this company a few years back, our goal was to build a low carbon ammonia facility. However, as the climate crisis you know, became much more acute and as the technology really matured and became more um, um, you know, commercialized, we have the opportunity to now buy electrolyzers on a mass scale that we didn't five years ago. So Greenfield pivoted from building and developing a low carbon facility to developing a zero carbon green ammonia facility that we're in the final stages of financing right now. One of the benefits that we had, and Corey, you talked a little bit about this um, in your remarks about the existing industry, is we had the rare opportunity to start with a blank sheet of paper. And that's a big deal. We don't have legacy assets that we had to convert. And so we had the ability to really do a completely green design. Now, the other piece I wanna talk about <clears throat> is what makes the upper Midwest so compelling. Obviously, if you are gonna make green ammonia, you need to have green electrons. 
And green electrons are not widely available throughout the world. In Iowa, we are um, blessed with great wind and a lot of abundant renewable electricity. Secondly, we're really lucky to have a very abundant ammonia market. It's, it's arguably the best in the world. And so what that gives Greenfield is a lot of optionality. And there's really three areas that we think about when we think of marketing. Number one, molecularly, green ammonia is the exact same thing as conventional or gray ammonia that the farmers use today. So our initial plan is we're talking to our offtake partners is that we are gonna sell our green tons locally to gray farmers. In Corey's remarks, he mentioned the evolving credit market for the green credit or the attribute, which we're all participating in. There's a number of global efforts that we are involved in. And what we ultimately could do is we can sell the gray ton to the farmer, but also sell the green attribute or the green credit once that market matures. Finally, the other option we have as the market matures at a later date is to sell that green ammonia, what I call that pure green ton as a premium. We are actually in conversations with um, various manufacturers who really want that attribute. So that's what makes um, this um, financially feasible is you have a lot of optionality even as the market's developing. Um, next slide, please. So what is green ammonia or green nitrogen? Is it really alchemy? A few years ago, um, in fact, I would say a few decades ago, there were early attempts to produce green ammonia. And there were a lot of scientists who were trying and it almost felt like this medieval attempt to turn wind into fertilizer. And um, this process has been around for decades. It's not new technology. But what's made it viable really goes back to what's happened in the United States last August. And you know, several speakers have talked about it, but the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act is a game changer for this industry. It certainly helps the blue um, ammonia um, producers, but it also significantly helps those of us who wanna produce green ammonia. And this is how it works. First, hydrogen is the most significant part of making ammonia, that NH3. There are 160 kilograms of hydrogen in every ton of ammonia. You times that by three, assuming you have a zero or near zero carbon product, and that translates into $480 per ton tax credit. Now we understand the tax credit is just for a decade with the first five years being direct pay, but it allows the industry to get off the ground and mature um, in the events, you know, we, who knows what happens in 10 years, right? But the upside, besides the tax credit, which is such a game changer, the upside, and I'd like you to turn to the next slide about future opportunities, is really the future of green ammonia. And for all of us in agriculture, I want us to take a step back and I don't care if it's green or if it's blue. What I want to talk about is really this is ethanol 2.0 in terms of the rural industry and agriculture's ability to participate in the energy industry. We have an unprecedented opportunity here. And I really begin, believe we're just at the beginning of all the options. Green ammonia particularly has huge potential both on the farm and off the farm. And what makes green ammonia so compelling is hydrogen. If you just look at hydrogen itself, it is dense and it's extremely hard to transport. This means that green ammonia really is a battery and it's a carrier of hydrogen. That's why it's so highly sought after. So with all that potential, I really want to get back to the farmer and I'm going to turn it over to Carl because as we think about the future of green ammonia, I want to talk and have Carl talk about what that means for direct application on the farm. And it all comes back to the farmer. 
Carl, I'll now let you, we'll go to the next slide and Carl will tell us what it means really on an acre basis. Over to you, Carl. Thank you, Linda. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. This comes back to a bumper sticker I saw when I was in college that said, think globally, act locally. And if we take a small trip back in time about 11 months ago to the Farm Foundation seminar entitled Solving Barriers to Agriculture Carbon Markets. This kind of covers it in a nutshell, but more importantly, it breaks it out in a system that we can understand. If we look at the whole Venn diagram, Shelby Myers mentioned that 10% of the world's emissions come from agriculture. That's concerning because over the last 20 years, they have not reduced by that much, only by a small amount of offsets. So the presentation basically talked about the lower left hand corner that says carbon offsets. In other words, there's certain practices that farmers can do. We can do cover crops, we can do reduced tillage, plant trees, et cetera. The presenter from Iowa State at the time, Dr. Palenstein, talked about the top circle, carbon intensity documentation, the science behind it and how it works at the farm level and how to monetize on it. But the 800 pound gorilla running around in the room that no one really wanted to talk about is carbon reduction. And that's where Greenfield falls into place. There are many ways we can do it. We can do biodiversity through crop rotation. We can use biodiesel. We can use many other fuels to help reduce it. But in a corn wheat system, the easiest way to produce or reduce our carbon is through the use of green ammonia. And I'll explain how it works at the farm level. Next slide, please. We're using the GREAT model in this situation here. Basically, it's a simple model to, that kind of explains the situation of producing corn. We can look and see where our carbon footprint in, lies in terms of grams of CO2 per megajoule of energy. The brown section indicates anhydrous or nitrogen fertilizers in general. With this, we are 6.6 of the problem, or basically about 34%. With it, if we use green ammonia, which derived from water and renewable electricity, we will be able to knock that out of the equation. And what's even more interesting is, if a farmer such as myself chooses to use cover crops, now we're at an 11% or 11 offset, which ultimately reduces our carbon footprint in grain farming, whether it be corn or wheat, by about 90%. Those are real numbers that we can take to the bank. More importantly, our end users of our products, such as the ethanol industry, the sustainable fuel industry, and more importantly, the livestock industry will truly benefit from low carbon corn. Next slide, please. This is a look at the farm level. I know this looks complex because it is complex, but I'm gonna focus on the left-hand column. And Corey had mentioned the process of Haber-Bosch process to produce ammonia. We're using the same process, but instead our hydrogen is derived from basically renewable electricity via wind or solar and water. Our plant uses significantly less water than a traditional ammonia facility for a multitude of reasons. But more importantly, we are not using any fossil fuels in this process of manufacturing. So ours basically, per unit of N, we have zero pounds uh, of CO2 equivalent. If we look at urea, that has about 3.2 pounds. Anhydrous ammonia is 2.4 and UAN has about 5.2 pounds of CO2 equivalent. Well, those numbers really don't mean anything to most people, including myself. But where they do mean something is, is when I can apply those numbers based on how much application. So we used saying that I put down 200 units of N, if I use green ammonia, we're focused on the center column, zero. On urea, 
we're at 639 pounds of CO2 equivalent per acre. Typical gray ammonia is 45 pounds per acre. And UAN, oh, no one wants to talk about that. That's 1,040 per acre of greenhouse gas equivalents. Ultimately, what it amounts to is this is, as a farmer, if you have a choice today and you care about the environment and the greenhouse gases associated with corn production, use anhydrous ammonia. It just makes sense. But more importantly, when we move to a green or blue ammonia model, we will have a direct impact on farm greenhouse gases. Couple that with a few other practices, whether it's bioadjuvants, whether it's cover crops, we are on a successful path to decarbonize our chain and truly move that number down from 10% of the world's greenhouse gases to maybe 5% within a matter of a decade if we continue on this path. I'd like to thank you today for your time and we'll turn it over to Jay. Thanks, Carl and Linda. Uh, and thanks to all five of our presenters. Uh, we are actually uh, about four minutes ahead of uh, the Farm Foundation schedule plan. So that's really great news. And uh, we have plenty of time for Q&A. And we've had a few Q&As uh, piled up in the Q&A box and a couple of others that have slipped over into the chat box. So let me uh, start off and come back, uh, Sherry, to you. Um, you talked uh, very comprehensively about how you're converting a very sophisticated process of bringing animal waste into a more sophisticated crop nutrient uh, condition. Uh, one of the questions in uh, the Q&A box uh, is about the consistency of the product uh, plant nutrients that you're generating. And I'll add also, uh, what about the analysis of, of the secondary and micronutrients? Uh, how, how are you tracking that? And what do you see as the future in terms of that complete fertilizer nutrient kind of picture from the source of animal waste? Sure, the, um, the N NPK powder is actually very consistent. It's a 333 fertilizer, um, pathogen free. Uh, that I've mentioned before. Uh, the aqueous ammonia um, can be concentrated at different levels. Um, really, you know, obviously at 10%, it's a very safe um, uh, product. Um, it really just depends. It uh, can go up to 20% um, depending on regulatory factors. So um, consistency is, uh, is great. Um, there was one other question that I did answer in the chat box, and this was like, okay, we're, we're grazing, right? So how do you capture manure in the fields? Um, so during the growing season or grazing season that I call it, um, there is a reduction in manure capture, um, 20 to 30%, um, because they are out on the fields, but they obviously come in, they eat there. Um, and they are milked in the uh, barns. And so that's where, where we capture. We strategically have them out certain times of the um, uh, growing season at certain uh, hours of the day. And then, uh, but then we can capture all of the rest of the manure. So there is that, that swing factor on a conventional farm. You know, you would be very, very consistent. Um, you would not have that grazing uh, factor that you would have to uh, have less manure during certain times of the year. Fantastic. Linda and Carl, uh, I know in some of the other conversations that we've had, you mentioned uh, something about the green energy in this corner of Iowa that you were focused on as being stranded. And I think that's an important uh, phenomenon to understand uh, most of us think about electricity when we turn on the switch in the room or plug in our toaster. Uh, but in fact, uh, there are practical transmission distances for electricity. And uh, I think that might be something helpful to understand better so that we can understand how all of this can translate into green energy being a useful source for production of, of green fertilizer. Jay, I'll turn that over to Carl. And Carl, when you answer, maybe give a little bit of insight on the smart grid technology that we also plan to use. 
Definitely. There's a joke in Iowa. When the wind blows, the power is low. In other words, we have an abundant amount of wind energy, but we can't get it out. And with that, it's great that we have it. And the reason why we have a lot of wind energy in Iowa was the legislation back in the 1940s provided wind producers to sell the power on the grid and the grid had to be built to it. But ultimately, the wind production was overbuilt. The second coupling factor is Iowa has very limited fossil fuels, whether it's coal or natural gas, we were always energy importers. That grew the grid phenomenally in, in, a, in a great way. So today, with this abundant wind energy, there's a couple of pathways that we can go on for harvesting these electrons, as we'd call it at a lower rate. One could be behind the meter, which would be part of the solution, but more importantly, attached to the grid to help all producers of wind energy and run our electrolyzers on an intermittent basis based on the smart grid. You can see that we use 145 megawatts of power. The reality is if we ran full out, we would run, use about 110. We have overbuilt the electrolyzers for a hydrogen storage system, or some people say at the Department of Energy, a battery is what we actually are. And we run our ammonia system 24 seven. We just store the hydrogen off hours. And this way we don't hurt customers, whether it be in Chicago or other spots in the US. Great. Linda, anything further to add? Well done. Thanks, Carl. Great. Uh, I see Bruce Knight's question in the Q&A box about uh, what's the total investment in green fertilizer. Uh, how many dollars startups and or total research is going on in this space. Uh, so Alzbeta and Corey, maybe you could lead off and then others could chime in. I can start and passing on and pass it on to Corey. So a couple of things when it comes to investments in uh, lower carbon nitrogen fertilizers, we at IFA um, have started tracking it um, about a year and a half ago. And we will include it in our IFA stat. But the reality is that we have a lot of announcements and very little has actually happened. So even in the United States, there's a number of announcements, a number of companies started doing it because of the tax incentives, but it hasn't quite translated into, um, into the projects on the ground. Some of them obviously started, but we're going to see 20, in 2026, 2027, we are going to see the real impact of those of those projects, and at that point, we'll provide to the membership the statistics on it. So um, the growth, uh, the planned growth, is tremendous, double digit uh, percentage wise. But we'll have to wait another year or two to actually see it on the ground. When it comes to startups, it's actually very interesting because Actec startup universe last year was about twenty nine billion dollars, and that came down quite a lot uh, from the year before for obvious reasons. But if you look at which are the categories that get the most uh, venture capital funding, it's mainly grocery delivery. And that's true globally. Um, grocery deliveries wins each and, you know, in, in pretty much each and every market. What we are seeing a little bit of is investments on a farm. So digital, um, digital ag, um, we are seeing uh, a little bit of investments into better use of uh, plant nutrients on a farm. And we are looking also at investments in companies that Carl and, and Linda described, so distributed production of nitrogen through other means on the farm. But the investments are relatively small at this time. Um, Arctic is popular, but not as popular as other parts of the investment universe. I think it's going to take all of us to actually direct funding to where it needs to go so that we can support innovation, because this is where we really need to put money. Uh, over to Corey. Yeah, no, I, I would just um, reference our, our sustainability report where we tracked 1.2 billion in sustainability investments. Now, that's not necessarily all uh, low carbon ammonia investments. Um, I guess the question would be how you define green fertilizer. So I would put that in, in that category. Um, maybe I'll just provide a few anecdotal examples to just give you a sense of the scale of these investments. And to Elsbeta's point, um, there, are, there are many of these, many of which have not started, but I'll focus on two existing or some existing ammonia producers that are uh, members of TFI. 
uh, an, um, one, one investment was over 100. All three of these are in Louisiana, by the way. One was a $100 million announcement. Uh, another was a $200 million carbon sequestration announcement. Uh, one is a $2 billion um, uh, green ammonia plant, all three in, in Louisiana. So that those are just three examples that will give you a sense of the kind of scale of uh, capital uh, that it'll take to go into this to this effort. Great. While you're speaking, Corey, could you also address the question of secondary and micronutrients as part of this overall scheme? Can you repeat the question? Uh, I was wondering about secondary and micronutrients. Uh, so we all tend to focus primarily on the primary nutrients, but uh, as precision agriculture is getting more sophisticated, I think uh, we as farmers are learning more about where we've got deficiencies for crop production in some of those other nutrient categories and and how do we sort of track that and make sure that we're also looking for green sources uh, or greener sources, if you will, for some of those other components. Yeah, so Leibig is law, right? You need you. We, we're doing a lot to educate folks on the importance yeah. of those nutrients. The Micronutrient Manufacturers Association is part of TFI now. Uh, an interesting, um, you know, unintended consequence is the sulfur sulfur fertilizers are are exploding right now. They're 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 incredible. Uh, how much that market has picked up because farmers used to receive all of their sulfur needs from the rain. And all of the greening efforts that were done to clean up acid rain has left us with sul sulfur deficient soil. So now farmers are actually having to make investments into purchasing sulfur uh, to apply as opposed to receiving it natural from rain. So it, it's uh, interesting to think about some of those unintended consequences sometimes that happen uh, from some of our efforts. Um, Elzabetta was going to jump in. So Yeah, I was going to add something here. This is really, really important question, Jay, and I think farmers are grappling with it. So what we have done at IFA, we have actually, we're working very closely with the Scientific Council, which is a bunch of scientists from various universities in the U.S., Europe, Australia, Middle East, elsewhere. And they produced a paper about 18 months ago about what should be considered a plant nutrient and what are the plant nutrients that we should take into account. And what happened is that the UN, United Nations community, adopted their recommendation in a record time of 18 months. And so now all these additional nutrients have been accepted as plant nutrients. So the definition uh, which held for maybe 100 years or 80 years has been changed very, very recently, indicating that this is something that we need to pay attention to. And sulfur, as Corey rightly mentioned, it's, it's one, one such nutrient because the more we decarbonize all production, the less sulfur we're going to have, ironically, right? And so we will have to find another way to get there. And when it comes to other nutrients, uh, some of them are on a sort of strategic minerals list and, and we need to be quite conscious of where we're going to get them. So very important question that we need to think through. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. So I want to try to capture a couple of questions in combination here that uh, have popped up in the Q&A box. And one is about biogas. Uh, and is, is that considered? And is there any ammonia production being driven by biogas as an alternative to natural gas to get some of those kinds of green offset uh, considerations. And then another question uh, really goes to uh, the issue that, uh, that Linda and Carl have raised with regard to ethanol as a, a farming product outcome. And is that uh, sort of one of the cleanest kind of total green energy uh, sort of solutions uh, with uh, this entire nitrous oxide and, and fertilizer input uh, cycle here. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, Carl and Linda, could you talk a little bit about, did you look at biogas uh, as a feedstock uh, for your process? And is it possible to make the kind of plant that you're designing that could maybe utilize biogas as well as the electrolysis? Yes, by by all means, we looked at at biogas. The problem is, is it's the infrastructure around it. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, we probably sit on one of the best natural gas hubs our site does in the United States. It takes gas from six different basins, all fossil fuel based, by the way. But biogas in general, the cost of it, uh, 
doesn't really make economic sense today when we're competing against other industries that would prefer to purchase that gas at a premium because it doesn't impact their bottom line much. As Corey mentioned, natural gas, it's pretty relevant to the price of ammonia. In fact, you know, at certain points in time, it's from the low end, 70% of the cost all the way up to probably 85, 90% in given areas of the world. So we have the renewable electrons and we just want to tap onto them. And can you also speak a little further to the ethanol kind of outcome uh, solution for, you know, the, the farmer grain uh, market uh, creation? Definitely. Uh, as we're all aware of, CARB, probably California Air Resource Board, drives the ethanol market directly or indirectly, along with a handful of other states. They use another model, similar, we call it California Greek 3.0, and they look at every process in making ethanol cradle to grave because they want to know how much carbon is associated with a megajoule of energy, all the way from the transportation to how much diesel fuel we burn in our tractors. There is a comment posted on behalf of the nitrogen industry, and it was posted in regards to blue or green. And that comment will be discussed later in the, the future of, of CARB. But basically, they're looking at a pathway potentially down the road, not today, but down the road, that we can now, if, if Greenfield was zero and other products were 700 pounds per acre, you could use that zero if you can prove cradle to grave that that product was used. And why it's critical is, is we see a lot of companies today using carbon offsets through cover crops. We believe we're probably a little bit infant yet, but on the carbon reduction side, Ultimately, farmers will have a carbon score in what their corn is, and ethanol plants may or may not pay a premium, but other companies out there could, could pay a premium for these lower carbon corn products or wheat. And Carl, one of the things, and Jay, I think I would just add to Carl's comments that um, I think is a reality. Um, Corey talked a little bit about this too, but we're almost like 10 years too early. And before we can uh, adopt the greet on the farm level and have CI scoring for farmers, and I know there's a, a really good question in the um, Q&A about this as well, um, we need to have the product available so farmers can use it so it's legitimate. So then we can begin scoring it and creating a whole um, credit system around that. So our goal is to get the green ammonia out there and then build the market simultaneously with the standards and the requirements. So I chose the Golden Gate Bridge as the background photo for uh, this webinar today because I drove across the Golden Gate Bridge a couple of times over the last week uh, while I was in California on business, and I actually rented a, an all-electric vehicle. Uh, and so one of my frustrations is, even in California, it is a challenge to find a charging station that really runs at any kind of pace. Uh, do you think there's any hope that CARB and the California state government can really understand the story of a greener ethanol source being developed so that they just don't go off the deep end and think that every car in California can be electric? Well, Jay, they're almost there because I th as I understand it, the new California law by 2030 is they're going to require all new cars to be fully electric. And obviously the existing cars will be grandfathered in. But right. I, I think honestly, Carl talked about car setting the standard. We have to work, we have to work with them. And that that is going to be our key to um, getting the optimal rules and regulations. They're really the only game in the US right now in terms of standard setting at that level. Thanks. And it's a great picture, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so Jimmy Kinder asked, uh, I think the first uh, question in the Q&A box about uh, ESG factors uh, and how that's impacting fertilizer industry investment. Uh, Corey and Osbeta might uh, go to you guys So it, it, to lead off here. Uh, I think it's a fascinating question, particularly when you understand, Osbeta, the nature of your global indus commercial industry uh, ownership, uh, I think of minority fa fraction of the total companies that are in the commercial fertilizer industry 
are actually publicly traded companies that would worry more about ESG kinds of evaluations from a shareholder and stock market standpoint. But talk a little bit about the rest of the industry and how much they pay attention to ESG factors and evaluations. Great question from the audience. Great question, Jay. So uh, it's interesting because when it comes to listed companies, obviously there is a pressure from shareholders and that pressure has been pretty severe, especially in the production of nitrogen uh, because of the carbon footprint. And that is obviously married with the need for disclosure, um, which then drives the, the need for performance. But what is really interesting is that it's not just a question of North America and Western Europe. Um, it is actually feeding through banks as well. Mm. And we have had these discussions with a number of our members <clears throat> in the Middle East, um, where banks from Dubai and, and Saudi and other places are asking the very same questions as the banks are asking in the United States and as the shareholders are asking in the United States. So yes, up until the war uh, in Ukraine, it has been a driving question in terms of what gets financed and what doesn't get financed. What has changed the equation a little bit, but not a lot, is that we invited food security to the table. Um, mm -hmm. And when food security entered our dining table, pun intended, uh, we started looking at things slightly differently because we started to realize that we need to worry about availability of fertilizer as well. And so the quick fix of, okay, we are not going to finance anything other than green, quickly turn into, okay, there is blue or lower carbon ammonia that we need to finance because we are not going to get to green tomorrow and there'll be a transition. So I think the discussion became a lot healthier, uh, similar to the energy sector, where we realized that it's not going to be a switch that from day one to day two, we're going to go from fossil fuels to all renewables there's going to be a transition, there's going to be a pathway and we need to walk that pathway. So that's that's kind of where we are, not just a question of listed companies, it's a question of all the banks because we have seen that through various instruments in the banking sector like GFANS and a few other things that have been committed to in various COPs, banks actually care quite deeply about how their portfolio looks like. Loan portfolio, not the share portfolio. Yeah. Uh, Corey, I'm sure will add to it. As usual, Elzbeta did perfect, so I don't have a lot to add uh, other than maybe I'll comment from a U.S. policy standpoint and say that there's been a lot of attention on some of these reporting requirements all the way down to the farm level, particularly of scope two and three. And while the industry is committed to, you know, these ESG factors and, and reports because it's being driven by the market and private sector, I think there's some concern about uh, government enforcement all the way down to that farm level. Um, that would be my only addition. So since you uh, were efficient uh, with that question, uh, you have time to try to answer Gary Niemeyer's question, uh, which is probably a little more sensitive for you, Corey, but uh, I know you're up to the challenge. Uh, he asks about uh, consolidation in the fertilizer industry and uh, what that means to supply demand uh, balance and obviously price discovery, which uh, I'm sure you have an ad antitrust uh, statement to precede uh, your answer. But thank no, you. I, I, I appreciate the question. It's a fantastic question because we've been spending the better part of the last year and a half really trying to help everyone understand global fertilizer markets. And I use the word global intentionally because it's global supply and demand that really is where farmers and, and everyone should be focused and paying attention. I think a lot of um, articles that people may read may focus on a specific country's production. Uh, and, and while that's interesting, I don't know that it truly captures the global marketplace. So for example, 85% of our potash comes from Canada as a single source. Um, you think specifically this question's about nitrogen production. We are a net importer of nitrogen. So about a third of our nitrogen is imported. And so, you know, as you think about the market and what drives the market, that's where I would be focusing my attention if I were a consumer or a farmer is what's going on in Europe with natural, with uh, nitrogen production and natural gas. Um, you know, what's happening in China as they restrict exports or India as they do global urea procurement as one of the largest buyers of fertilizer. Um, and then within the United States specifically, which again is only about 60% of total 
uh, demand is met from domestic uh, domestic suppliers, we have 16 different nitrogen producers in the United States. So as you think about all of the NP and Ks that are produced, our nitrogen production is probably one of the most diversified. Um, but again, it's e even if it were less, it's really more of a question of global supply and demand and what's happening with producers all over the world. Great. Thank you. Uh, Cherry, I want to come back to some animal waste questions uh, and, and combine a couple from Alex Eccles and Bruce Knight uh, and a couple of others. Uh, so uh, obviously dairy production is very consistent with regard to milking cows two or three times a day. Uh, the capture of that waste is consistent and, and you're doing this 365 days a year. What about uh, pork production, other animal production as sources? And then uh, how does all that translate into the sort of total potential nutrient uh, value? Uh, I think it's a good assumption to say we're probably not totally wasting animal waste anywhere, but uh, some of the processes you described and, and outlined for us in your story I think give us an idea that um, much more efficiency can be achieved with all animal waste. Sure. So, yeah, I think as long as you have manure, um, whether it's from you know feedlots, um, uh, pork producers, um, possibly even chickens, you know, you uh, certainly can can use um, that product. Um, you might have to, you know. Uh, utilize it a little bit different way, putting some water back in so that it, uh, it is in liquid form in order to go um, into this process. But, you know, I think um, what is important is uh, right now we're, you know, we're handling manure as a waste, right? It's, it's a byproduct. It comes out the other end. Our value is in the milk, but we have to have a new mindset that yes, manure is a value product. Um, and, but how can we, you know, tweak it, change it? I mean, it's, it's like what they've done with milk, right? You don't just do milk, but now you process it and you make a lot of different things with it and it's much more valuable where you can store it, et cetera. So as we have gone through this process for us to be able to not have to handle the manure every day and put it on a field, um, and that we can, you know, process it, and put it into a form, a natural form, so there's not additives or weird stuff in it, that we can utilize it when the crops need it. And I think that's what the key is. And we're capturing and making sure that we utilize that nitrogen, because usually when you just put it out on the land, nitrogen, it kind of goes away. And so, you know, for us to be able to capture that, to really have our uh, uh, crops be as productive as possible. That is the most important thing. And um, while I'm at it, I had noticed that there was a question on, um, I think from Bruce on um, the um, the organic standards board. And, you know, so the NPK is certified organic and the, um, the aqueous ammonia is uh, it's there, but yeah, there is some pushback right now from the OSB. Um, certainly, you know, us proving that is it, this is this is just boiling manure and it's a chemical process. No pun intended of chemicals being put in, but it is a process, and so it's still natural and you know all that good stuff. So I think that's what we have to prove and make sure that 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 they're listening to that side of the story. So, Sherry, on that uh, topic, are there are, are you guys involved, or are you aware of any efforts to focus on some of these subjects in the 2023 Farm Bill to help provide and shape policy that uh, might further incentivize any of this in the states? Sure, I think you know um, when you're in this kind of um, I don't know, I don't necessarily want to call it a game, but you know, when, when you're in this field, you certainly have to hire your specialists and have them go to Washington and, you know, make sure that, that, that you're heard on various topics. So yes, we are involved in, you know, trying to make sure that, um, that this type of technology and products are, 
you know, certified organic and and uh, and certainly part of the part of the farm bill. Corey is a uh, registered lobbying organization. Do you have any views to share? <laughs> Well, I have a lot. <laughs> um, I'd say from a, a farm bill perspective, where we're really focused is uh, how do we use some of the conservation resources? And, you know, farmers want to do the right thing. There's funds that have been added to the farm bill, to the funding to, to do the right thing. But um, we've really been focused on how do we how do we get retail agronomists uh, empowered to be technical service providers to help distribute some more of these conservation uh, funds to the farmer? So you and others have referred to, uh, you know, precision agriculture, and it's really essential to getting to the ultimate application of the 4R program that, that uh, is a very favorite uh, fable of yours. So what about the capital expenditures for farmers to not only record and measure a lot of these factors with regard to carbon fertilizer use, but also then the capital expenditure to continue down that continuum of conservation agriculture, because you can't just park the moldboard plow and then expect to go into conservation and no-till agriculture and high efficiency fertilizer placement without some capital expenditures. Yeah, so I was really impressed. I'll give a shout out to our friends over at the uh, Equipment Manufacturers Association. They had uh, a really interesting uh, demonstration at Commodity Classic where they had all of the major original equipment manufacturers in a room ensuring that all of their technologies communicate and work across platforms. And, you know, I think that's probably one of the limiting factors is when you think about rebel, rel, uh, variable rate application, uh, is, you know, do you have that tool, those tools and equipment to, to be able to achieve what you want to? Um, I think also the ag retailer is equipped to, to invest some of that capital on behalf of the farmer, but also some of the systems and the data that I think will drive a lot of that decision making. And then I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about um, some of the carbon markets. So we had one of our ag retailers uh, speak at a conference recently, and they said they were looking at a pool of about 2,000 farmers within their network. And they started to narrow down the qualifications of who they could work with to you know, enroll in uh, some sort of a carbon market program. And after they put them through the filter and the funnel, those 2,000 narrowed down to three, three farmers. That was it. And so, you know, as we think about what it's going to take to to achieve some of those, yes, it's not just capital investment, but it's also the fact that farmers have been doing a lot of these practices because it makes good business sense. Yeah. Uh, Tom Gray asked a very good question here at the bottom of my Q and A box. Uh, is there any interest in developing multi stakeholder cooperative structure that could combine? food security, community, and return on investment. Uh, and I, I think, uh, Carl and Linda, we might come back to start with you because uh, I remember in one of our earlier conversations, you emphasized the farmer investment in Greenfield, uh, but that it is not a cooperative. So talk us through a little bit of that and what a larger vision might look like for maybe a bigger kind of scale cooperative effort uh, in this space. Carl, can I just start first and then I'll let you, you go? So the first thing is um, we, we have the foundation, Jay, as you talk about our farmer investors. We are not anti-cooperative. We would love to partner. And I really believe the future of agriculture is the alliances that we form. It is not Greenfield by itself. And But the, the issue is getting agriculture to wake up and realize that green ammonia, in our case, it could be bluer, is really important. And it's not just for the application and the reduced CI score, it's obviously also for food security and everything else. I had hoped the um, recent issues in the past year with very high fertilizer prices for all the global reasons, Corey, that you've alluded to would be a catalyst to, to bring groups together and to have that sense of urgency to participate, not just by a farmer by his, his or herself or a co-op by, by themselves, but to bring it together. So. I, I want to see it happen. 
Um, and maybe the Farm Foundation ends up playing, you know, a facilitating role, but we need to be partnered together. That's why we got started all the way from the manufacturing side to the food on your table. So we are ready. Um, we'd love help putting the vehicles together. And Carl, anything else you want to add? De definitely. In the view of it being ethanol 2.0, Garner being the first site, and we have other sites located as well that we could potentially grow on. I think the cooperatives are absolutely key to decarbonizing their chain in multiple fashions. Corey had mentioned ammonia being used as maritime fuel. With that, there's also other companies out there such as Emoji who have created uh, anhydrous ammonia fuel cell tractor. So whether we look at Case, John Deere, Agco, many other manufacturers, you, you can even look at Cummings Engine today and CAT, they're looking at fuel cells as well. I mean, the fortunate is, is you know, they, they'll, they'll need some source of fuel, but to be invested in that, that, that's probably a pretty key place to be because we know that, you know, we can't change the batteries in our combine very easily, but we can probably fill that tank up with ammonia very readily in, in many parts of the Midwest and use that as a fuel to be operated through an ammonia fuel cell. Carl, can you also speak to uh, the sustainability of, of wind and solar energy, uh, especially across state lines, right? So there's uh, most of this, as I understand it, and certainly from my home state of Illinois, um, even county by county and even township restrictions on wind and solar. Uh, I look at, at least in Midwestern agriculture terms and as a farmland owner myself, wind is much less disruptive than solar for the functionality of, of farming. Although wind has you know, some of its consequences with regard to farming practices as well. But uh, what do you see in terms of better harmonization across these states around some of these green sources of electricity? Well, if I were king for a day, I would re-explain the situation. And what it is, is it's wind to fertilizer. And if you can't explain the simple math, you probably shouldn't be in the business of it. So with that, as an example, in your neighborhood or my neighborhood, yeah. one wind tower at one megawatt would produce somewhere around 30 to 40 uh, tons of fertilizer a year. I believe if farmers through whichever wind company could see that monetized on their farm, whether it's a payment investment yeah. in a hydrogen slash ammonia facility, if they could see the net result of it, you would see a lot more people willing to sign up because now all of a sudden, rather than putting up a hog farm on your, on your farm, Jay, you're mm -hmm. putting up a fertilizer factory that's actually green and yeah. you don't have to do chores in the morning. So with that, I look at it in a different perspective even to that same perspective, whether it's Case, John Deere, who Agco, whoever it may be, we could even look at it as a, a effort to go and provide fuel to our tractors long term. Yeah, and and that's how how we have to look at it if if we want to grow the wind industry in the United States. There's seventy thousand windmills today. If you, I mean, if you look at it, they'll probably keep growing. Solar is very controversial. I, I understand it, but wind is probably the the pathway that works best in a, in our area north of I eighty. Mm -hmm. So, taking that strategy, are do you think as farmers we're smarter to focus on these opportunities and not be so distracted by? carbon sequestration deals that, you know, are everywhere you look, uh, you know, in the farming community, there's someone that has a scheme for carbon sequestration, but I just had breakfast with another Illinois farmer here in Washington this morning, and we were bemoaning the fact that when you pencil it all out, there's a lot of money in this, but almost none of it gets to us as farmers. I think the rising tide lifts all boats from a farmer's perspective. And I think it's geographically where you live. Mm -hmm. 
in some area, I joke, I live in pretty flat black country and you can probably fall plow and have minimal erosion other than wind erosion. Not that I practice it, but in other areas, you get in Eastern or Western Iowa where it's more hilly, by all means, they need cover crops. I mean, they need something because the livestock basically disappeared or became industrialized and they're trying to corn and soybean farm in the hills. And I'm not picking on them. I'm just making a point that what works in one neighborhood may not work in another neighborhood. So we're definitely for carbon sequestration in any way possible, whether at the farm level or the ethanol plant level, we need to keep focused on it. But I do believe there's opportunities that everyone can participate at some level, whether in, in some RECs, they have a community solar farm. That would be an example where if you want to reduce your energy cost for a farmer that has a wind turbine up, if they could just see the light of day on it, where the energy is going and it can be used, whether it's tractor fuel or mm -hmm. anhydrous ammonia, I think you're going to have a lot more positive outcome with it. And, and it's a win-win for everyone. The, the government incentives are behind it and it works. Mm -hmm. Well said. Thank you for that perspective. Uh, I want to go back to a question uh, from about 25 minutes ago that Jeff Berg uh, put on the Q&A. He says, I understand that using a C or carbon score because of C equivalency, equivalency is used, but should we not have an, an, an N score and CH4 score to address the emissions directly since there are such a large component of uh, greenhouse gases uh, related to agriculture. So I think Corey and Alzbeta, that might be a good question for you guys, uh, but also, you know, for our Greenfield friends, uh, talk us through that uh, with regard to nitrous oxide emissions from our use of a variety of fertilizer sources. Corey, why don't you start? I'll go off to you. I was hoping you'd go first. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think Elsbeto will probably talk a, a little bit about just conversations. Uh, I think about my friends at the American Beverage Association, and I don't have a beverage here, but you know they united as a group to to put calories on their can, and uh, as a part of transparency and, and commitment to sustainability. And so, as you think about the food industry, will there be a day when packaging will have the carbon intensity of that packaged product has been a, a, an interesting conversation. Um, I want to just comment briefly on our low carbon ammonia uh, uh, standard and certification that, that our ammonia producers have been working on, because the idea is that it will measure the carbon intensity of that nitrogen. So that is the uh, end objective of what we hope to achieve. Uh, we are really close to being able to announce and release that. Um, we're actually testing a few of those um, of those facilities now, so doing some field tests of that of that standard and that calculation. So I think I think we're there uh, as it pertains to uh, low carbon nitrogen, at least. And, and Jay, can I just add? I think um, Corey, to your point, I think we're getting there, um, closer in some circumstances than the others, but. What's interesting is I would go back and I know it's US based. Um, so Elsbetta, this doesn't help, you know, with other regions around the world, but let's go back to CARB. And again, I think the GREET model is a wonderful scoring system and it's been validated. And, you know, we hope eventually that we will get a more specific end score for, you know, green ammonia and the various other um, products that are made. We're just not there yet, but we need to keep pushing. And I, from a very U.S. perspective, think GREET is highly credible, and that could be the basis for any scoring of N. Can I take a little stab at it on the farmer level? The, yes. the question was centered around the nitrous oxide emissions. <clears throat> so when the fertilizer arrives at the farm, numerous studies, whether it's Iowa State, many universities have done this on the application. Of course, you know, assuming all positive now, they've test, tested both extremes, whether it's wet soil or, or dry soil, they apply ammonia in to find out the nitrous oxide emissions as it decays. With that, GREET takes into effect that account. And part of the situation with UAN, why it's so high is, is one, it's in the manufacturing process, but the other is basically the release through the breakdown process. That's why when I showed that chart, ammonia was a little 
at lower compared to like urea or UAN, I'm not bad mouthing them because I use both. <laughs> and with it, it, it's just the idea that if you're truly concerned, that's taken into account in those models. So back to how does it all add up in the end in, in terms of scoring? Well, I like to tell people when I first started out farming and I needed to fill out a credit app, it said, just your balance sheet, you know, what's your net worth? Pretty soon, the next thing you know, after 2007, eight roll around, what's your crop insurance next to the balance sheet? I believe the third one in the future may be, what is your carbon score? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it's going to dictate the lending, but what it could do is dictate markets for end users of grain, whether it be the ethanol or the, the livestock industry or sustainable aviation fuel industry, there's probably going to be some value add in the future. We just don't know what it is today. But I believe it's coming in the pipeline. As much as everyone hates the scope two and three emissions, I mm -hmm. think it's knocking at our door. And to Corey, I would much rather as a farmer be proactive on it because it puts us in better standing with the global trade, whoever it may be with. So Carl, it uh, seems that we always come back to the bankers. So uh, we should have had a banker here with us today, but uh, maybe next time and Martha, we can take a footnote but, for that. Oh wait, uh, you do. Alzbetta is a is a former banker, so she's a, she's a recovering banker. <laughs> I think I think recovering. Yeah, indeed, indeed. But no, look, I think it's a great idea to actually bring folks who are going to finance this transition. Um, and I just want to add to what was just discussed. I, I actually agree very much with what Corey and Carl and everybody else said, which is that we are going to, to the world where we are going to have carbon footprint, just like we have calories on our packaging. We're going to have carbon footprint on our packaging. It's already starting in Europe. We are seeing it. And that's going to go all the way to us. That's going to go all the way to the farm, through all the plant inputs, and all the way to how the product is packaged. So we better get our arms around it so that we know what what that's going to look like before somebody actually imposes it on us. So very much agree with everyone. And that's my only point is I think we would prefer seeing market driven, whether that's by banks or by consumers, by the industry, as opposed to government uh, driven. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So fantastic. Uh, any final remarks from any of our panelists uh, as we uh, get toward our wrap up time here? Well, Again, I want to thank all five of you for a fantastic series of presentations and interactions here. Uh, it's been one of the best webinars that I've uh, participated in. Uh, big thanks to all of our Farm Foundation uh, supporters and friends who have joined us. We started out uh, around 200. Uh, we're still hanging in there at 88 participants still with us. Uh, Martha, I think that uh, is a resounding vote of confidence for the topic that Farm Foundation picked for today and uh, a big affirmation for the expertise that our panelists brought. So I will say once again, thanks to everyone. And Martha, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jay. And thanks to all of our speakers for the insightful discussion today. And again, I want to convey our thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us, submitting your questions. We appreciate your engagement with us and we'd love to hear your feedback. So please take a moment to share your comments about today's session in the brief survey you will see at the conclusion of this forum. As I mentioned at the beginning of the forum, Farm Foundation is celebrating our 90th anniversary this year. You are all invited to celebrate with us in Chicago this June 15th at the Drake Hotel for an unforgettable evening of special programming, including announcing the winners of the 2023 Farm Foundation Awards. Please help us recognize the notable leaders and change makers in your circles by nominating them for an award today. Nomination materials are due by March 31st. You can learn more about the awards and the gala on our website at the link being posted in the chat. If you'd like to help us continue providing valuable programming, such as today's forum, I'll click, quickly remind you about becoming a friend of Farm Foundation. Check the link provided in the chat to learn more. Each and every gift to Farm Foundation strengthens our ability to address rapidly evolving issues impacting agriculture, the food system, and rural communities, and we are so grateful for your support. Thank you once again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at a future event.